Okay. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today for this Learning Network webinar on data use for MCH public health practice. This webinar will be presented by Dr. Carol Gilbert, who I'd like to take a moment to introduce. Carol Gilbert is, has worked with, at CityMatch for over two decades, supporting MCH leadership in local health departments across the country. She provides training and technical assistance for epidemiologists and also works with program managers to build their capacity for incorporating local population-based data into planning and decision-making. She has analyzed vital records, PRAMs, purpose, and census data for public health planning, and her research focuses on the strengths and limitations of population-based data. Her academic training includes a PhD in medical sciences interdepartmental areas at UMC College of Public Health, a master's of science in mathematical statistics, and a bachelor's of science in engineering. Again, this webinar is being recorded and a link to the slides will be um, sent out to those who are registered after the meeting ends. If you have any questions, Dr. Gilbert is comfortable with you interrupting her throughout, so feel free. Um, otherwise, you can also utilize the chat if you don't wanna come off of mute. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Gilbert. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm not sure that you see my picture on the slide. My video is on. I'm not sure that I see what you see, but anyway, I'm happy that you're here. <laughs> and we will, this, <laughs> this uh, topic here is pretty wide, um, data use for MCH public health practice. There's a lot in there. Um, what I'm um, going to talk about mostly is what I've done research on and what my practice has shown me is important is that um, the, the data isn't perfect and we need to be aware of its shortcomings and how we need to how and we need to find ways to use it anyway because we need it. So that's where I'm coming from. My position here. That's a picture of me. That's my bio. You don't see me. So rough learning objectives, and these aren't really in order. Uh, that uh, so you can't live with it, and you can't live without it. That's one of the problems we have with data. Is that true? Yeah, kinda. Um, and we have to identify the limitations of population-based data, and I am focusing on population data, which I'll tell you more about what that means. And then mitigation, you know, ways to use it carefully, even though it's not. Um, it, even though it's not perfect. And and what are the harms if we didn't use data? I'm gonna touch on that a little bit too. So population-based data for my purposes right now is data that includes or represents everyone. So if, for example, data sources that include everyone are things like the decennial census and vital records data, which is one of the cores of our MCH uh, practice. Everybody gets a birth certificate. Everybody, in theory at least, gets included in the census data. That's its definition. Um, data sources that represent everyone are also super important, and those include a lot of public health surveys like BRFIS. Um, American Community Survey is a, a census product that that does sample surveys in between the decennial census years. And that's really important for us to use in MCH too. It's a great source of social determinants of health data. Uh, PRAMS data is an example of a survey that represents everyone because it is a random sample of the vital records birth data. So it represents live births. Um, there are also data sources that represent everyone in a program um, or in a or everyone who uses a hospital. A lot of times these are administration data sources, administrative sources that we can use for public health. For example, whoever's in Medicaid gets all their health records collected by Medicaid for your state. And that is data that can be used for public health purposes. Other examples of administrative sources are um, hospital discharge data and and uh, health care data from electronic health records. Those are all important sources. And they these bottom this bottom row is very good for people who are in a certain group, but not the everybody that we usually think about in public health. 
which is usually everybody who lives in our jurisdiction. So what is population-based data? Again, for our purposes, I'm talking about numerical, categorical, like male, female, other, and logical, like yes, no, or checkbox. They're facts and summary information about the jurisdiction or the subpopulation that we're interested in. So a lot of times this data, data is starts out as just a list of all the people and some important numerical or categorical facts about those people. But then you can also summarize it and that becomes data too, data as well. Summer, summary data would be like the average, the percent uh, that said yes, that kind of thing. Then we can summarize at different levels. Often we can summarize at our jurisdiction level, which is often a county for the people on this webinar. But you can also summarize at, at smaller levels. So what do we use data for in public health practice? A lot of times we use it for keeping track of our health. Um, like, and that is surveillance. That is public health surveillance. Um, surveillance sounds like spying, and, it, and of course it isn't at all. It shouldn't have a negative connotation, but it kind of does when it sounds like spying. Um, but we do need to keep track of the health of our, our communities. We need to know when something's going wrong. We need to know when something is going right. We also use it for assessing needs, needs, needs assessments. Um, we use it to evaluate the effects of our programs and policies. Are we doing the right thing? <laughs> Are we doing it right? Um, it's used for designing, guiding the design and the redesign of programs and policies, including policies and programs to communicate health and to do advocacy, to say, we need this policy. We use data for for to back up those those claims and to help us um, know what to communicate. And we use data for quality improvement. There's probably other things. I hope you guys will tell me in a few minutes when, when we open it up to talk. I hope there's not a lot of shy people on this call. So a lot of times we need data just to satisfy requirements. Like our funders require proof of the need that we say we have. Um, they want quantitative proof. They want counts. They want data that represents our jurisdiction. Um, and oftentimes they require evaluations. So we need to be able to count things and measure things and measure impact. Um, also peer review publications. Some have a lot of pressure to in, include data. You don't always have to have population-based data, but sometimes uh, it helps. But the real need, <laughs> The real reason we need data is to make good decisions, right? We need to make our decisions based on all the information that's available. And a lot of these public health data sources are right there available, and we should be using them to answer questions like, how big is the problem? Is this a problem for maybe, maybe we see a problem that's brought to us in the form of a story or a complaint or a finding on a case review. Um, somehow we learn about something, but we need to know how big it is. Is it a large proportion of our population? Also, how severe is the problem? Does this problem lead to death? We would also look in the literature for things like that about severity, but we can look in our own data to see whether it's, whether it's severe in our population. Does it lead to severe illness, hospitalization, um, problems with school, problems with social determinants? So we need to know, like, are we going in the right direction, roughly the right direction? Um, and is our policy or program working for us? So really important things, not just requirements. What can population-based data do that other kinds of information can't do? And so here's some of them, like we can't really assess risk unless we know population because to assess risk, you need a denominator. You need a whole population number in order to know whether your problem is a big problem or a little problem or the risk is high or low. And assessing preventability, you can do that with, with um, population-based data and that maximum potential impact that you could have and the actual impact over time. All those things are things that you need population-based data to do. So the data has information. You can use that to do better. But data can be wrong. 
There are lots of ways data can be wrong. I listed five of them, but I bet you can think of a lot more. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll give you a chance to say those as we get, get more into this. So one of the things, most obviously probably, is that things about a person can be measured wrong. We can have wrong measurements. Things could be entered, data, in, data can be entered incorrectly into the forms that we're using. Things could be not entered at all. So there is no data for a, for a particular thing. Like <clears throat> there could be a whole bunch of mothers and the mother's weight could be just not entered for one mother <clears throat> or a bunch of mothers. Also, another problem that's really hard to deal with sometimes is that whole people can be missing. How do we know anything about that person if they're not even in our data set? And then the worst thing about all of these is when these errors are systematic, they can bias our results. We'll talk a little bit more about this on the next few slides. So examples of things about an individual that can be measured wrong. If our hospital scale is reading 200 grams too low, because it wasn't calibrated, um, it'll have what what will happen is that many babies will all the babies will be a little bit will have their weights measured low. They'll be if they're really eight pounds, they'll be two hundred grams less than eight pounds. But many babies will be around twenty five hundred grams in reality, but they'll show up as twenty three hundred grams. They will appear to be low birth weight. So our accounts of the babies who are low birth weight and our percent low birth weight will end up being too high, Un, uh, not as high, too high compared to reality, right? Um, and if another example is, what if mothers interpret questions differently? Some mothers interpret um this, this is a question that actually was interpreted differently in PRAMS. Just before you got pregnant, how did you feel about becoming pregnant? And some mothers who uh, had mixed feelings interpreted that because there wasn't a choice about mixed feelings. They checked the box. Uh, I didn't want to get pregnant right then. Um, when we gave them the choice later on, years years later, to uh, to pick, I wasn't sure how I felt, a lot of mothers who had interpreted it as not wanting to get pregnant, check that box of, I wasn't sure how I felt. So interpretation makes a big difference in, in some questions. Another one that comes up a lot is um, his people who are Hispanic, we, we often want them to check the Hispanic box and then check the white box unless they're another race but they think of themselves as non-white, so often they don't check the white box. They instead might check other or other race because the race and ethnicity are two different things on forms. So forms are like my worst enemy, and these are just examples. Uh, in, per in my personal life, forms are my worst enemy. I hate them, and I think a lot of other people do and have stumbling troubles with forms. And these are important. These change what we measure and how we measure. Another one, remember, was that things can be entered incorrectly. Uh, for example, the pregnancy checkbox on a death certificate is a famous one. Um, they put the pregnancy checkbox on death certificates so they would catch more maternal deaths. Um, but <clears throat> this, the use of the pregnancy checkbox was spotty. Um, some of them some of some oftentimes it just wasn't checked when it when it should have been checked and that was probably because the person who uh, filled out the death certificate just assumed it wasn't related to the pregnancy or didn't know that the person was pregnant but when they link data sets together when they link death certificates back with birth certificates they can sometimes find people who didn't have a pregnancy box checkbox checked on their death certificate, but actually had been pregnant or were pregnant recently. Oftentimes this happens, being embarrassed to ask the person what their race is. So we just guess, we just write in what we think it is. And self-reported race is better probably than just guessing by the person who happens to be filling out the form. 
other ways, um, things could not be entered at all. Uh, one that's really common is maternal educational attainment, which is an important thing that we put on birth certificates and fetal death records. Um, is It's a really important uh, thing that we use for measuring socioeconomic status. It's one of the few things that, that really does that for us because mom's education is higher if she has, she will have more income usually, generally speaking, if her educational attainment is higher. But also it's an indicator of her parents' um, socioeconomic status. So it really is a good measure of socioeconomic status, but there, uh, there's a whole bunch of fetal death records where this isn't put on. They don't do a thorough, um, thorough data entry uh, in many states on fetal death records. Um, there's a there's a lot of other examples too. So, what about the problem that whole people are missing? Um, do we think that some home births don't get a birth certificate? A lot of people think that, but actually. Um, we do pretty well with getting birth certificates for everybody. Um, who is missing from the youth risk behavior surveys, the YRBS surveys? Um, you prob If you use the YRBS, you probably know that this is a survey that uh, is done on kids who are in school. And if they're in class that day, they all fill it out. But people who are not in class that day or people who have dropped out, or um, people that are homeschooled are never in class on that day. So people like that are missing from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. And if we use it to represent all kids, we're getting a slightly skewed picture. If we use it to study kids who have uh, problems related to dropping out from school, then we're getting a big problem in our answers because those kids probably aren't in this survey and we're not understanding their, their circumstances as well as we should. Um, the census actually uh, undercounts young children. This, we know there are different problems with the census and that it undercounts homeless people. That's been common, but they actually um, found recently that they undercount young children by about five and a half percent, which is a pretty big undercount um, for the census. They're investigating this. They don't know exactly why it happens. But if you look here at what they did was to compare the census counts to the birth records and the, and the death records from the National Center for Health Statistics. That's our vital records. So they think the vital records data is their goal. They use it for their gold standard. Um, and the, and the census data falls short based on that as a gold standard. So there, there are problems with people missing. Here's another one. This is one that I found in vital records in, in my research that I did for my dissertation. What this is is a graph of uh, deaths. Infant deaths is the um, red line. And fetal deaths is the... Is that right? I'm not sure I say it right. <laughs> yeah, infant deaths is the red line, and fetal deaths plus infant deaths is the blue line. But I have little dashed lines that are confidence intervals around each one. This is the percent of the babies that are born at each of these birth weights, the percent who got a death certificate, the percent who died. And so babies here who are born at 1,350 grams don't have a very high chance of dying. So there's a lot of them who um, who don't die, but babies who are born at 500 grams, 60% um, of them, about 60% die. And if you look up here, babies that are born at 250 grams, about 90% of them die. What does this mean? That babies that are born at 250 grams, 10% of them survive. Um, we know that isn't true because babies that are born at 250 grams just don't don't survive. It's not a viable birth weight. Um, and so what this means is not that these, uh, this is a group of states, the line comes from states, but that uh, many of these states 
are not giving death certificates to those tiny babies who are born alive. And they, they don't get a death certificate. Some states have a have a rule that their um, data systems use. They go back into the data and check for babies that are very tiny and see whether they got a death certificate or whether they were discharged from the hospital alive um, and make sure that they that they get a death certificate. But but a lot of states don't have that in their in their data cleaning plan. And so it makes it look like survival rates are unrealistically high for babies who are who are born <clears throat> very tiny. So just this is just little little reminders of ways that our data is not perfect. In most cases, this won't make a big difference, but if you're studying very low birth weight babies, that kind of thing can make a difference in, in the surveillance, in the results that you see when you're checking, when you're, when you're following, tracking your um, surveillance, or you maybe comparing hospitals, maybe do, checking to see whether an intervention is working. If you think that babies are surviving at those at less than 500 grams, then you're going to be steered a little bit wrong. So I would love it if you guys could chime in and talk about the data sources that you use or the data sources that you manage, because you know a lot about those data sources and what their limits are. Now that I've sort of um, brought up some of the problems, can you bring up some more of them? This is the test to see whether people are sleeping out there. You are allowed to talk. There are some comments in the chat, but people are welcome to unmute as well. Why don't you go ahead and read the ones in the chat? Yeah. From It was a few slides ago, but um, Rami said that sometimes there are no schools in a county jurisdiction that participate in YRBS as well, so it's not county specific. Um, we have another comment. Examining... Excuse me, univariate? Is that a word? Did I say that yeah. right? <laughs> univariate or bivariate patterns can guide researchers to identify systematic patterns of bias. Mm -hmm. Another comment. I Go think um, census does not include incarcerated folks. And then we frequently use FL charts and undocumented families was another comment of maybe missing data sets. Oh, they are flowing in now. I can't. They are flowing in. This is great, <laughs> except I'm going to have to. Yeah. Maybe, can you see them now? I put them on the screen I'm sharing, but I don't know if they show up to you. Um, they do not show up on the screen, okay. but I can see them. Um, I, can re I can read them. That's what I can. Okay. I, I wanted to go back to the question about um, YRBS. Yeah. Sometimes there are no schools in a county jurisdiction that participate in YRBS. Yeah, so you can't really count on them uh, measuring that county's youth. A lot of counties have opt out um, thing rules where the parents can opt out of participating and some parents do. Counties also have opt in rules where the student can't participate unless their parents opt in and these schools uh, these counties have terrible uh, participation rates because some parents just don't bother to opt in. Um, examining bivariate, yes, patterns. Data patterns really help you identify patterns of bias. That's right. And that's what I had to do for, for my research, of course, because there's no other list of babies that got death certificates. They they could only, and it were for fetal deaths, well, there were also patterns that were problem. But the only way to see when somebody's not included, can if you don't have another another denominator source to check with, is to look at patterns. So yes, that's really important. And oh, I can't remember if census data includes incarcerated folks. Somebody who's more up to speed on census could could uh, let me. But little kids wouldn't be incarcerated anyway, so that wouldn't be affecting that undercount. Oh, you use Florida charts. I was going to ask about that. Can you, um, Tanisha Avent, can you um, tell us what you use Florida charts for and whether it has, whether it 
how how does it help you? Or are you too shy to unmute? <laughs> yes, um, we use floater charts specifically to um, get down to, we actually are, are, are grateful here in Florida that floater charts will get down to zip code level data. Um, I'm from the March of Dimes, and so we focus on preterm births and C-section rates. And so we, um, it really does help us get more hyper-local uh, data and be able to target our programs that way. Yeah. Okay. Do you see any um, quality problems in the, in the Florida charts? Do you have any concerns about it? Maybe. Yes, I mean, there are some ethnicities that aren't represented. So, of course, you know, there's an issue there because some of, depending on what indicator you're looking at, it kind of just has black, white, or other. Um, and so, of course, that's a large group of individuals that we're not capturing. And that information is really important to help us with targeting our programs. Good point. Yes. What you record about the person. And if you only ask black, white, or other, of course, the the vital records data does act. It is self-reported. It lets the mother, theoretically, lets the mother choose what her race is. And there are a lot more choices than black, white, or other. But sometimes if the numbers are too small, a lot of uh, data sources or summarized data about that community uh, will will mush everybody together, a lot of people together into one category, which really is not, it, it, it can be very misleading. That's true. Yeah. Yes. Vital statistics shows private pays. Yes. Um, ACS has a lower response rate from those living in poverty. So there's an undercount there for poverty. Um, NSDUH. What does that stand for? Silky von Essenheim. NSDUH. Don't know what that stands for. Out doesn't include incarcerated or unhoused folks. That's a big problem with census data too. Um, making white the standard when there should be the statement, if this group are the beneficiaries of structural and systematic racism, how do we change it? So this is an example of how you interpret those data summaries. Um, instead of just saying white people are better, which is what people hear when they say, this is a data communication issue. Um, when, when people see white people having a better outcome, they will hear inside their head or in, in some way, they will hear white people are better. And we want to make sure to say explicitly what's going on here. And this is a good example. This group are the beneficiaries of structural and systematic racism. Well, that's about communication. Um, in our own, in our health record, this is Martin Eskendon, patients who have a visit with a provider but an incorrect diagnosis or diagnosis code, so you must be using, yeah, hospital discharge data or electronic health records. Yeah, if the diagnosis codes are wrong, you don't, um, you don't get the information that you need. And sometimes they are wrong because doctors are not properly trained. Sometimes it's a billing issue or a motivator um, that if they use certain diagnosis codes, they get paid uh, for it and other diagnosis codes, not so much. Um, Medicare and Medicaid do a lot of work with doctors to try to get them to do certain procedures and treat certain diagnoses. And that does affect the, the prevalence that appears in the data. Um, so it is here um, in Tina, the differential response rates for specific groups like race, ethnicity, yes. This can impact how will the survey, the survey represent these populations. You can't always wait to account for this properly. Yes, and I haven't even talked about wait, waiting the data, although that will come up a little bit later. Um, state it's unclear to me what the state is doing to the birth data that takes longer to finalize and is one year behind CDC wonder. <laughs> the state needs it at least a year to add cohort deaths to vital stats. So why does it take a year to add the cohort deaths? <laughs> because they have to wait a year to see if the baby died. So there is some reasoning behind um, vital records taking a while. A lot of states release the data um, early and then correct it later. They also um, they also have to be corrected for births 
that it occurred to people who live elsewhere and your birth that occurred somewhere else for people who lived in your state. It takes a while to get all those things together. Um, insecurely housed is not captured well. You must be talking about in the census data. That's true, yeah. So how what we ask for makes a difference in what we get, obviously. So here's somebody, Justin Coleman. I work mostly with EHR and vital records around NBS. Oh dear, I don't know what NBS stands for. Mostly, you, you can holler out if you if you can just fix that one or let, let us know. I mostly see missing ethnicity and racial demographics. And is that data entered by someone else or the parent? It's someone else, right? Um, and there's a lot of issues with that. Some people, I, I do work with some uh, hospitals who are trying to do better at entering their <laughs> ethnicity and race data. And sometimes they say it's it's sort of embarrassing to have to ask and they um, just leave it out. Or, you know, things are intense. You know, these are people who are going through a, a health crisis. And sometimes it's just they don't they don't want to bring up that stuff. So they get stuff that's on the chart uh, and they don't try to talk, have conversations with the patient. If you guys who work with electronic health records have more comments, that would be great. Um, we do have a hand raised from Owen. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much for your um how comfortable you feel about talking about this. I, I can feel that and, and it's very nice to see a speaker like you and, and today. Thank you. So um, my question is in terms to know who is missing is those we capture data. I think I see, I see an issue. I wanted to see what you think in terms to the, the number of variables that we have to understand problems, diseases, conditions, or episodes of you know, happen to people. I, I I don't believe they usually we use enough variables to understand and and of course understand um uh, and getting also from those people that we they are we are not missing, but on, on get some information on a daily or monthly or quarterly basis to to really get um more uh, adequate information to to address and move policies and strategies. So I think the design that we have um, in public health, for example, and in healthcare, sometimes is 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 a little bit shooting in a failure because, like, if the doctors know that that information can be used for research and they have to be complete, administrator, we will do a better job. But it's not in anticipation of those uh, 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 rules for anyone. To say, I think that's the reason we have. Uh, uh, you know, a, 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 we have a lot of data, but um, those that we capture data, I don't think so we have, we use the data because we don't use enough variables and we don't anticipate that, that level of analysis later. But thank you. The two problems, I think, I'm hearing you say that partly we don't use all the data that we have and partly the data is not rich enough to really give us all the, all the answers, all the details about the person. And I agree and actually have more more slides about that, about that later. Um, yeah, those are good points. Our data, and and if you've ever tried to make changes in the data, PRAMs and vital records, I've been involved with redesigning those, and it's really an act of Congress, almost literally, to get a new data, a new piece of data, into one of these sources. Um, some states are better than others about updating. But if you change it too much, then you make it less comparable for past years and. And there's a lot of issues with changing data. It takes, well, we did a data update, a huge update of the basic vital records uh, form that the, the CDC designed and made. And it was approved in 2004 and not all states used it until 2015. So part of the issue is that um, it wouldn't be standardized even within a state, it takes a long time to make to do the training that you need to make people use the new, the new data. So it's like moving. A, I don't know. It's it's very a very slow process. Very. Yeah, slow. One more hand from Tanea. Go ahead. Oh, I was just also just trying to summarize some of the comments in in mm -hmm. the chat too. Is just the um, 
uh, what is accessible or available could be different um, from the, the, the raw or confidential data. So, um, and, you know, not, not only, and this, that could be a whole other uh, webinar is just on the who gets to use the data and, or what parts. And obviously, like with the census, um, we, we don't have, uh, very few people actually have access to the, the confidential data. You have to go to perhaps, um, uh, you know, a state university that has made arrangements with the U.S. Census. Um, and then for birth certificates or vital records. And some people mentioned, you know, a business case use is obviously looking at urban rural differences, particularly like maternity care deserts and, and other things. And so we need to see those small numbers, but they're often suppressed um, because of, say, HIPAA um, or or other sorts of uh, federal state policies. Um, so, you know, trying to get um making arrangements to see those small numbers. Um, you know, again, a completely other <laughs> webinar, but, you know, sort of like, oh, uh, who, who is missing and why um, mm -hmm. is, uh, it could just be, you know, because of policies. Yeah, yeah, that's really a good point. And you're right, it is a whole nother webinar. And it's partly another webinar because it's different for different states and different places. Um, they're, they're, and it's, it's a different thing that somebody is not in there at all compared to somebody's race information or some, whatever demographic information you need to break it down by is not in there, then they might as well not be in there, even though they really are, right? Because you can't get data about them if that particular demographic thing isn't included. But this whole issue of HIPAA and privacy is not supposed to be an issue for public health use at least by a public health department. Um, there's federal laws that allow public health departments to use those raw data files that you were talking about to be able to break them down as well as they, as well as they can. But a lot of states are having trouble right now even having health departments get access to it. Partly that's because health departments don't always have the capacity to do the right kinds of analysis. Um, if you're if you you have an epi in your health department, chances are they haven't been there very long and they won't stay very long. If there's a high turnover rate for epis, um, then they have a lot of duties, especially if you're in a smaller health department, and they might not have the training to really use the data use the data right. So sometimes state health departments kind of guard the data and try to put it out in in correct forms and. And then, the, and that's not always good enough if you're a local health department trying to do quality improvement or trying to engage community. Um, you know, in theory, this data belongs to the community where people live and they should be able to use the data. And you as a health department are the government. You are the people. You represent the people. So you should be able to use that. Um, I think that I should continue on I, I really appreciate all these comments. And I think there are a lot of these comments. I hope you guys are um, copying them or we should probably grab them before we close this. Um, it, yeah, a lot of good comments about how come things, how things go wrong and what the impacts are, what we don't collect, what's undercounted. Very good comments. So thank you very much. And I'm going to keep going because uh, there's a few more things to cover. Hopefully. So yeah, how do we fix it? Um, and some of these are pretty obvious, but hard to do, like what you would ideally do to see whether you're doing that first problem wrong. You know, it, is the data being entered right? People do chart audits um, to see whether health data is correct on a form, maybe in vital records or in hospital discharge form. You can go back to the chart and check certain data. It's very expensive to do that, but you can... Uh, Sometimes when people do pay what it takes to get those chart audits done, they will publish it. And then you can learn to see which are which data elements tend to be reported wrong or or underreported. Um, so that's one one thing that you can do is look in the literature, find somebody else's chart audit or do one yourself. You can also do review the equipment. 
You can set up systems to check um, data entry, like those states that follow up on the tiniest babies. You can set up systems like that when you get a um, when when you get something that you can predict, you can set up a system to check it. You can also have data entry forms, and we're getting better and better at this as we get more sophisticated with data, but data entry forms can check for inconsistencies and unlikely values that get entered, and they can fix it right, right away as the data is being entered. So there are some things you can do about accuracy. Training is an obvious one. Um, a long time ago, <laughs> I've been in public health for too long, I think, but we we changed the way we define um, SIDS and and SUID. They 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 did some changes and they decided that it was important to do autopsies and things like that. I'm being pretty vague, but um, there was a lot of training that went into that, and and. It is, and it needs continuous training because the staffing changes. The people who fill out those death certificates um, leave their job and a new person comes. And the CDC actually has programs to train people on entering data that's that's tricky, like like uh, SIDS and SUID. Uh, There's a sleep-related infant death, for those of you who I don't, try not to use too many, too many abbreviations. <laughs> but training is really important and really hard to keep up with. Um, one of the ways that we check to see if our data in us in our our sample um, is correct is we compare it to the to the population data that it's supposed to represent. And here's an example. This is always table one in, in studies. Um, and this is a study where they were comparing the hospitals in their study to other hospitals to see what the prevalence of these different um, important factors was. When the prevalence is different, then you know, well, you're not representing, um, your data is not representing as well as it, as well as it should. But you, and you can check if you can find a, a denominator population that's worth it, that, that works. Like if you have a PRAMS data set that you're using, you can compare it to birth certificate data. And then actually they reweight the PRAMS to, so that it matches the birth certificate data better, but that is not a perfect process. The weights do not produce perfect matches. And if you're studying a particular thing, you might you you still need to check and see whether whether it represents the population, the underlying population, which is live birth. There's another example of table one where you compare the population that you that you have to the population that it that it should be. And you can do statistical tests to see if it's really different. Confidence intervals is a really important thing to use. I, um, it the the in theory you need confidence intervals when your data is a sample from the real population because the sample doesn't quite represent is isn't quite the same and uh, the confidence interval will tell you how far off it could be. But you also use confidence intervals when your data has small numbers. That's that's important because small numbers vary a lot over time. And you don't want to make a decision based on very small numbers um, for, say, this year, when you know they could double or be cut in half the, the following year just because of random numbers. This is one of the concerns that people have and why small numbers are often suppressed because people get all excited when they have um, the death rate is twice as high. But if the pop, if the population is small, numbers are small, then those death rates are going to go up and down quickly at random with no underlying change. So it's important to use confidence intervals when you have small numbers so that you know whether this change is bigger than random. You don't want to make huge decisions based on something that is really could be random. There's a this is what confidence intervals really is. It's the con it's the confidence that um, your the the real number is within your data's confidence interval, the real actual mean. And I just going back to the little confidence interval that I made before, this is a, a confidence interval around this 90%. And I did this because I wanted to say, you know, could it just be random error? And no, the confidence interval is so narrow that clearly there are many states that 
think that they have a 10% survival rate for babies born at 250 grams. So it was important to use those confidence intervals to know when something could be random or not. It's not that they're perfect. <laughs> the other thing that you can do when you have small numbers is use control charts. Now, this is just an example from, from the internet. I came from engineering where control charting started um, and they use control charting for manufactured parts where they wanted them to be in control. They wanted them to be a random distribution around the the uh, the mean that they had selected for their part. And then they wanted to, when something, some cutting tool was wearing out or something, the, the measures would go out of spec, out beyond the specification, and they would know they have to replace the cutting tool. This is what they were used for. Now, people are a lot different, but when we have small numbers, we can still watch for trends. We can still monitor things in those small numbers, but the control chart gives you an idea of when you've got differences that are normal, expected differences, and when you've got differences that are beyond normal and, and indicate that there's a change, that a change has happened in your system. And their um, niche is supports control chart use. Um, if you want to know more about those, I can also help you too. It's not something that's commonly used in in maternal and child health, but it but it really does have its uses, especially if you're concerned with a small population. So back to the first question, I wanted to just bring up that data sources that include everyone. Um, when the, everyone is a small number, we can still use confidence intervals and control charts and things like that. On the or when data sources are randomly selected from a source, that's when we really need to use confidence intervals because we don't have uh, we don't have the whole population. So every single estimate we get from something like BRFIS or PRAMS, we have to have a confidence interval because we know we don't have the whole population in that sample. So the confidence interval tells us where we think the whole population data really could be. So data isn't everything. We really, um, we, we know this. Um, so we have to add to the data with other information. And I think that this is be a great place for you guys to chime in with. I'm just checking back on the, on the, oh yeah, Callie's capturing, checking back on the, um, see if there's any questions in here. Lots of data quality comments, very helpful. Um, but I think it would be great if you chimed in with how you use data as I'm talking through these, chime in with how you use uh, data, other pieces of information to bolster your um, the information that you get from population-based data or the other way around, I have to admit, sometimes um, the other kind of data is super strong and you just need population data to help back that up. So I always like to say that um, the table of understanding your population um, requires four legs at least that I can think of. Um, and one of those legs is case review data. We have a lot of case review processes that are out in communities now. We have fetal infant mortality re reviews, child death reviews, maternal mortality reviews. Um, some, some communities have syphilis transmission um, reviews. There are fetal, uh, there are HIV um, exposure reviews, maternal to child exposure. There are reviews for a lot of things. These case reviews are so in depth. Going back to what um, our our friend whose name I can't remember <laughs> said that the the problem with these population based data sources is there's so few variables collected, and really people are a lot different from that. People are complicated, um, so these case reviews are your chance to get in depth. That's one one thing, and the population based data is definitely one of the legs. Um, research, we often um, neglect that as, as people working in the field. We don't have time to keep up with all the research. There are sources um, that help us with that. I know that a long time ago, Florida used to have a research division. I don't know if they still do, 
um, where they would try to keep up with the research so local health departments could call on that division in the state health department to find out what's the latest thing you have on this or that. Um, Georgetown has a database of recent research on at least things that are related to the national performance measures. That can be very helpful. And Google Scholar is out there for us. So we there's a lot of research that's public that we can get at. It's not perfect, but um, using sites like Georgetown, which is the uh, MCH Evidence Center is what it's called, those can be really helpful to you to get access to research if you're not in an academic um, department. And then though that experiential knowledge from the community, and that might include people who work for your health department. It might include the families um, that you serve and um, professionals from other sectors, people who don't work from your, for your health department, people who are familiar with the other systems that affect human beings who live in your community. So people who work with the police, with the transportation systems, um, people who uh, work with the schools and the social services. Um, a lot of communities pull in people who just are people who live there. Um, who have knowledge of what it's like to be in these systems, and they can help us make better decisions with their with their life um, life skills, their life experience counts. That really does count, and we need to use it in part in our decision making. <clears throat> so this is the this is also more of that same question that there are a whole bunch of important things missing from our data sources. We can't get at things like why somebody did something what their intentions were, what they perceived at the time. Um, were they misinformed? Um, and also life course factors. Most of our data sources that we use and the way that's easy to use them, they come from one point in time, the birth or the death or something like that, one time of the interview. They are not usually linked together to be able to represent the life course. Um, what happened to this, this mother who now produced a preterm birth was she preterm herself? That involves linkage to across time, and that's not easily accessible to us. Um, so we don't usually get to look at that. And many data sources, most data sources, don't ask the person what happened to them in their past that could be helpful. But you can, if you're talking to that person, you can find out things like that. Um, sensitive topics are often not even, we don't even bother to collect them. We don't, on vital records, well, the standard vital records thing doesn't include questions about drug use. It's a sensitive topic. It's illegal. We're, we're, are we going to get good data if we ask? Probably not. Um, PRAMS does ask about some of these things. Uh, domestic violence is definitely in there, but it might be underreported. Um uh, it doesn't also, it also seldom, PRAMS does, but most vital records doesn't ask about the systems, you know, that affected the mom and the baby. Did they get good, um, good help from social services or was it a, was it a problem for them? Um, and actual causes are also way more complex than the ICD code would indicate. Um, and we do, of course, get an underlying cause of death that comes from a CDC algorithm. So there could be 10 or so um, ca causes of death listed, and we will get one underlying cause to use. Um, for most of our studies, that's adequate, but still, um, it's not enough. It's not rich enough. And this is my, my mental picture of what these limitations look like. The world is really this beautiful, colorful, three-dimensional ball, and vital records data for example, any population-based data source really shows us just the outlines, the rough outlines. But if you are making decisions about, um, you know, where to walk on, this, on these islands, you know, you want to know whether you're going to step into the sea or whether you're going to be on the land. You, you need to know some of this basic, um, the basic outline stuff. It's not enough, but it is important, right? It's, it's necessary, but not sufficient checking to see. Callie, if you notice anything that I should interrupt with, there and you guys are also welcome to unmute and just holler out. Yeah, there is one question. Um, how can public health agencies incorporate the principles from community-based participatory research or CBPR? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not an expert at CBPR, so we might have to get another speaker who here who can do it, but we do um, 
and mostly public health our public health departments are not really doing research so part of the thing about cbpr is that the that the people who the research is about are designing the research and help helping to collect the data and interpreting the data. And we do use those principles. We should use those principles in, in public health, even when we're not doing research, even when we're just trying to understand a problem in our, in our community, but, you know, and, and we can call this research, we can make it research, we can publish it and it can benefit other people. I, uh, there's a person who I really admire who works for the, Eileen Dololau, who works for the um, Multnomah County Health Department. She told a story at one of our city match conferences about working with um, local tribal leaders, tribes, about using PRAMS data. She wanted to offer them the use of PRAMS data because it's there, why not use it? So she didn't go to them and say, here's all the results from your PRAMS data. She went to them and said, um, we have a survey that asks mothers questions soon after their babies are born. Would you like to have information from this survey? And they had a lot of concerns about the survey. Was it accurate? Was it to represent their populations? Did it undercount? who was Native American, and yes, it did, because the, the um, vital records did as well, and it links to vital records. Um, so she worked with them for, for weeks, going back and forth and back and forth, and figuring out what they not wanted, what would be useful to them, and then she produced um, summary data that they could actually use. And they developed a good relationship, and they actually did help improve the data by having this relationship. And that's sort of an example of how public health practice can do, can do, can incorporate at least some of the principles of community-based participatory research. There may be, oh, there's somebody else who knows her. Yeah, yeah, she's great. Um, but yeah, if you have other ideas, this is something you can interrupt me about. I'm always happy to hear about that stuff. Now, we're coming up to the one hour mark, but we have plenty more time, right? Callie, we don't have to stop since we're already... Yep, we have one minute left. If you have to leave, that is okay. I already put the evaluation link in the chat. So if you <laughs> so do that, please. Right. I'll just go really I'll fast. Go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. So um, case review data and the experiences of people help us to see the world like it is and really see the faces behind those numbers. Um, there are limits for case review data. Um, one of the important things is that they look at those events, those terrible events like a death or a transmission of, of HIV. Uh, the population of people who get the transmission or get the death are, is very different. It's small and it's not represented. And I wanted to show you guys this data just to emphasize how different the population of deaths is in terms of risk factors compared to the population of everybody. So all the births. Um, only a few people die, and the risk factors are just enormous compared to co compared to the people who don't die. So when you're only looking at deaths in your case review committee, you get used to looking at deaths. You get used to that population. You need you need to be aware <laughs> that that it's not everybody. It's not everybody at all. That was one thing I want to make sure I got through. And the other thing that's closely related to this is um, that. In order to do prevention, the epidemiologist will always tell you that you need to intervene on the people at risk, the population at risk, because you don't know who's going to have the bad outcome. You need to know the information. You need to study the population who's at risk of having it. So you need that denominator population. <clears throat> and there's some examples of how data can be used together this might answer the question about how how community-based stuff can be um, can be incorporated. So mothers in review, this is about how death reviews work with population data. Mothers in review deaths of preterm babies said they didn't know how to recognize the signs of early labor. So the community was thinking about doing an educational campaign. Um, the PPOR data, which is vital records data, said that there's a lot that preterm birth is a big deal and it's accounting for a lot of our excess mortality. So that's, yes, this is toward the um, educational campaign. Also, PRAMS data said that a whole bunch of mothers um, reported that their prenatal care provider hadn't talked about the signs of early labor. So 
This is where the story data comes together with the population data to make it clear what, what should be done. Um, and here's another one. This is a case where um, there were sewer deaths, African-American mothers, 30%, it, the PPOR data said 30% of preventable deaths is due to sewage, and the sewage mortality rate is higher among African-Americans, and the community team used case review data to figure out what was going on and what they could do about it. They didn't just rely on the population-based data about the prevalence, because this whole thing is a lot more nuanced than just do they sleep on their back or not. And this is a model for how um, case review data is used with population-based data. This was back, this was made way back when um, both of these processes were fairly new and the, the people realized that they could be used together. And a lot of times they are, the two pieces are put together at the place where you're doing planning, which is the community action team. So they hear the recommendations from all the information sources and then develop plans and put them together. And I think we're pretty close. I can skip this. This is just about making a denominator. Um, that the denominator makes a difference. And this is the, the last slide. <laughs> if you don't use data, you can go off the rails. Um, that's just, we, back to that picture of the of the earth. We, we do need to have that population-based data, even though it's not perfect and it's not complete, it still gives us some important guardrails that keep us uh, knowing whether we're going in the right direction or not, at least. And that's all. Thank you for hanging in here. And thanks for all your comments and participation. That's all I got. Great. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. We appreciate all the knowledge that you have. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. And the thank yous are flowing into the chat now. Um, we appreciate you being here and hope you'll attend future webinars. We have two great presenters scheduled for November. So be on the lookout for emails and follow us on social media to get notified of those next ones. All right. Appreciate it.